series. Wonderful to be here. Um, and so today's sermon is on self-reliance, and I know it's a pretty sharp crowd, so I'm not going to surprise anybody if ultimately get to the point to where you realize self-reliance is not a good thing. So I'm just putting that out there now. But there's a little bit more in here, I hope, than just that. Um, so, But I want to just put that out there because I think you guys kind of probably figured that out already. So I want to start off with a little bit of a discussion and definition of something called transcendentalism. So this is from uh, Britannica Online, Encyclopedia Britannica Online. It's a 19th century movement of writers and philosophers in New England who were loosely bound together by adherence to an idealistic system of thought based on a belief in the essential unity of all creation, the innate goodness of humanity, and the supremacy of insight over logic and experience for the revelation of the deepest truths. And this was kind of a kindred to the German transcendentalism that had been going on. Um, and one of the people that was, uh, that was actually involved in the German transcendental movement was a man named Emanuel Swedenborg. And those of you who are familiar with the 12-step and self-help movement, actually the wife of Bill Wilson, who was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, or one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, was a Swedenborgian. She was. She grew up in that in that faith. Um, another thing, also to point out with this transcendentalism, is that this is what um, began to in New England change things over. So the, all the the universities that were there were initially founded as schools of divinity. They were schools for biblical study and scholarship. Yale and Harvard and Cambridge and all those. Well, transcendentalism in the in the early nineteenth century around 1800 or a little before, took deep root in Harvard. So that's where, so Harvard, the School of Divinity in Harvard essentially became the hot spot for transcendentalism in New England. So that was part of, and it was just a little bit at a time, a little here. So I want to point out a couple of things here because we still see these exact same ideas today in modern society. So for example, the innate goodness of humanity. So that's not, that's not biblical. That is not a biblical, that is anti-biblical. Um, but it's the idea that we're all good people. We just do bad things. And so it's not a big deal. Um, another thing, another one of the key points of this was the supremacy, supremacy of insight over logic. So in other words, what I think is more important really than what makes sense or is right. So if I think it and I can form it, essentially that makes it right. And then this one here is really, um, and, and my, my time spent in, in the, the self-help and 12-step movement and everything, this thing here, this idea that experience for the revelation of the deepest truth. So in other words, my experience is much more important than reality or what truly is or what truly happens. So as long as there's something that I experience, I can, I can frame my own reality based on my own experience. So if this happened to me, then that means that's the way it is for me. And if I think that this should be that way, then that's the way it is for me. Maybe yours is different. So this should sound very familiar because this is what we call modernism today. But it's not a new thing. It's just, it's just the outgrowth of this. Um, and also it was tightly tied with Unitarianism. Um, and actually, I think I have on the next slide here. No, I don't. Okay, I took it out. So um, make sure I don't have a slide on it real quick there. So Unitarianism is, uh, they claim to be a Christian faith, like many that do, but um, amongst a couple of their real major heresies are the fact that they deny the divinity of Jesus Christ. And they also deny the inerrancy of Scripture, because they're kind of, like we just read here with the transcendental, you can sort of, sort of make up your own what is right and what is wrong, and what's good and what is bad. So one of the most famous transcendentalist that came out of Harvard in that per, during that period of time was a man whose name, at least you'll probably recognize if you don't recognize specifically his writings, you will, once we read a couple quotes, is Ralph Waldo Emerson. So, and he, he wrote, uh, he wrote, let's see, no, I have, can I keep that in there? He wrote a bunch of essays that were published over a period of time and one of the most famous ones that he wrote was called Self-Reliance. And here's a few quotes that he is well known for. So, um, once you make a decision, the universe conspires to make it happen. 
So again, that's just witchcraft is what it is, really. It's like, you know, once you set your mind to something, the universe gets in line with it. You make your own reality. You make your own truth. Um, he says here, it's easy to live for others. Everybody does. Huh? <laughs> he doesn't know me, obviously, back in my former life. <laughs> I call on you to live for yourself. Well, okay, I heard his call, apparently, without even ever hearing it, I heard his call. Well, as a young man, I heard his call and did live for myself. Um, here, shallow men believe in luck or circumstance. Strong men believe in cause and effect. So, in other words, those supernatural is really what he means here. So, when he says luck or circumstance, he just means supernatural, things that are beyond our control, things that we can't see, feel, you know, touch, smell, taste. Those things are, those are pretty weak-minded. The real strong people, they believe in the physical science and things like that. That's the real deal, and that's how we bring about change. Um, and then this last one here on this, on this slide, trust thyself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. So in other words, trust yourself, trust your own heart, because that's, that's how you're going to find happiness, and that's the best way to fully actualize yourself. So I want to do a quick little side trip while we're here because – I want to point out how easily stuff we, we can look now and see how Harvard is just completely off the beam. And if you didn't know the history of Harvard, you would have no idea that at one point in time it was a school of divinity and that it was a biblical school. I mean, you would have no idea whatsoever. So and it just it crept in little by little, you know, from the 1600s on up till modern day. So here's something I saw. There's uh, apparently was a calendar, one of those little day by day things where you tear each you know page off each day and probably had it had biblical quotes and you know inspirational scripture on each each page. So on the third of July, it had a quote that seems like a very nice inspirational quote here. This is a picture from it apparently. I got this from the internet, so but nonetheless, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So that's a one, you know, worship God. But the problem is that who said this? It was Satan that was saying this to Jesus during the temptation. So, so that's a wonderful quote unless you realize what the context of it is. So it's that kind of stuff that can creep in. You don't even realize it if you're not paying attention. So I read a few quotes from Emerson. You may have heard some of those or not heard some of those. But I want to ask you, remember his name is Ralph Waldo Emerson. So I want to ask you, where's Waldo? I think we all need to be careful because we may find him in our own theology. So here's another quote from Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson, that uh, that is is definitely definitely been used in many a sermon. It was used in John F. Kennedy's 1960 inaugural address, and it is, "What you do speak so loudly that I cannot hear what you say." I'm sure we have all heard that, and we have thought, "But where did Emerson?" The Unitarian, the Transcendentalist, the man that believe we make our own our own reality and that our experience is more important than what is real and what is correct and what is logical. So I just want to this is and this is only one of many things. Brian has done a number of sermons over the years on, you know, the men that control the world from the grave. And this is just another aspect of that, of how easily this stuff creeps in and we don't even realize it. Just like the little page in the calendar. It seems that seems like a really good thing, but when we realize the context and we re, when we realize the door that we're opening to let this in, we always need to be careful. So I got a few other quotes here, worldly quotes, not from Emerson, but just different quotes about self-reliance or that basic idea. Here we have. Failure will never overtake me if my determination to succeed is strong enough. Og Mandino, I think it's Mandinko, actually. I think there's a G in there, but anyway, whatever. So um, the man who has confidence in himself gains the confidence of others. That's a Hasidic proverb. And things work out best for those who make the best of how things work out. John Wooden, I don't know who that is, but I put that quote in there because that's kind of a twist of Romans 8. 28, you know, all things work to the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You know, it sort of sounds like that a little bit, but it's not that. It's not that at all. It's a matter of once I set my mind on something, the universe begins to conspire to bring it about. I mean, that's really the, the spirit of this particular little slogan. A couple more quotes. Thomas Edison, 
There is no substitute for hard work. And one from Mark Twain, the fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. So again, that sounds good, but Mark Twain was not a godly man. And what he meant essentially is that if you're living life to fill it with all the joyful experiences that you possibly can, then what do you have to fear of your life ending? Because you've been living life to the fullest. And so since that's all your life ever consists of, and there's nothing beyond this life, why would you write? No regrets. No regrets. Um, I didn't, I wasn't, a, as, a, as a young man, I wasn't a big heady reader. I didn't read Mark Twain or none of that stuff. Generally in school, when they gave us assignments to read, I didn't do them. I typically didn't do them. But I had my own thing. So I was mainly into comic books and stuff like that. And one of the things that motivated me was one of these things that I thought, okay, well, if I just work hard enough at this, I can make this happen, was this. And some of you may recognize this ad here. But this little scrawny kid here, this little scrawny kid would see this. I was I was the 97-pound weakling. I, that was me, you know. And so I, I would see that, and I would be like, uh, uh, you know, I would be, oh, man, I want to have that. I want to have that. So it doesn't work. But so this is just an example from my life of something that was this self-reliance. Okay, I have a desire. I don't want to be a scrawny little kid that gets picked on and the girls make fun of. So I'm going to figure out how to do that. First, I've decided that that's what needs to happen in my life. And then, two, I've got to figure out how to make that happen. So self-reliance. So we all know, as I said, that the world, the world essentially teaches in self-reliance. It teaches that hard work equals reward. Now, there are many people in the world that complain that they don't get their fair share but when they say fair share, they mean, well, I'm working hard and I'm not getting as much as I think I deserve. And my reward isn't as great as I think I deserve. So even they believe in the fact that if you work hard, you should be rewarded. Now, the definition of reward, of course, is as various as there are people almost. What does reward mean? Sometimes people it might be monetary. It might mean power. It might mean influence, whatever it might be. Um, but the world teaches that. If you work hard, you should be rewarded. And if and there are many people that teach, if you're working hard and you're not being rewarded, then it's somebody else's fault. Or if you're not able to work hard so you can't be rewarded, then that's somebody else's fault also. So it's kind of a catch-22 there. The world doesn't really have a solution for any of this, but it holds on very strongly to the idea that if you work hard, you should get rewarded. And that's why there's all kinds of expressions and things Stuff that ideas that men's minds create and they promulgate and put forth, just like the quotes that we read from Emerson and some of the other people. The idea of, hey, the world's out there, you know, it's the apple for us to pick, you know, it's just waiting for us to seize the day. So that's the world. But actually, if you read scripture, there's a lot of scriptures that kind of have the same tenor, it would appear. So let's read some scriptures here. Let's start off in the beginning, essentially. Genesis chapter 2, verse 14 here. This is from the English Standard Version. Um, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So to work hard. The reason I use the English Standard Translation instead of King James is because King James says to keep it. So the word work, I just want to emphasize that. So hard work, that's from the beginning. God put us to work. He put us here to work. We had a job. Um, in addition, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7 a, it says here, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? So if you do a good job, if you work hard, won't you be rewarded, essentially? These verses can be interpreted this way, and they often are. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6, go thou to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. So in other words, don't be lazy, work hard, hard work. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. He becomes poor that deals with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He that gathers in summer is a wise son, but he that sleeps in harvest is a son that causes shame. Hard work yields a reward. Laziness yields failure and unhappiness. And many of these verses, Proverbs 14, verse 14, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and the good man shall be satisfied 
from himself. So his own hard work, the good man's going to be satisfied from himself. If he works hard, he's going to get a reward. And at the end of the day, he's going to be satisfied from the work that he did. And that's something that, somewhat of a side road. I realized this a few years ago. I used to read uh, every month. I would go through the Proverbs. So you know, each day, like one, two, three, four, five, you know, and then so I'd read it in the morning. That was and and there's a lot of good stuff in Proverbs, but I found over time that if you focus too much on just Proverbs, you kind of you miss the boat. I mean, Proverbs has some good stuff in it, but Proverbs were written by a man one that didn't have the Holy Spirit in the way we do in the New Covenant, and two, he fell off he fell off the path. Not all the Proverbs were written by Solomon, but many of them were, and and so many of them are these little bullet points, so they aren't. They're, they're more little bullet point things that in the proper context can be helpful, very helpful for life. But it's also very easy to misapply them because most of them don't have context. They're just sort of this, this, so they can be easily taken out and applied to this situation or that situation. And when my own heart gets in there and wants to twist things around, it can easily happen. So I just wanted to mention that sort of a side note. But here, as I said, Proverbs 14, 14 is another example where it talks about, hey, if you work hard, you're going to be satisfied. You're going to be happy. You're going to be rewarded. It's not just an Old Testament idea or precept. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 through 5, for example, we read Paul writes here, but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. Um, Paul, again, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 here says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. The thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Paul says similar in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any man would not work, neither should he eat. So these are verses that can be taken and applied out of context, and we'll, we'll cover that later, but to the idea that if you work hard, you'll get rewarded. And then if you don't work hard, you won't be rewarded. Uh, Romans 12, verse 11, another example here from Paul's writings. Work hard and do not be lazy. Serve the Lord with a heart full of devotion. That's from the Good News translation. So the world just screams self-reliance. The world screams that, hey, either you work hard and get rewarded, or if you seem somehow to think that you're not getting the reward that you think you deserve, then you got to find out who's stopping you so you can make them stop stopping you. And then we can see at Scripture in a certain light, taken out of context, teaches essentially the same thing. So we've got to come on from both sides. It's all about me. me. It's me. It's me. It's all about me. Self-reliance. i got to make it happen. i got to do it. i got to pull this off. So as I said at the beginning, I know you guys are sharp enough. You realize that's not true. The scripture does not teach us that. And that the world does teach us that because the world is against God. And the world wants to kill us. So let's read a few verses here that kind of quash that idea of self-reliance and being able to trust in my own ability. Psalm 146, verses 3 through 5 here. Put not your trust in princes, nor the son of man, in whom there is no help. And so myself, I'm also a son of man. So that applies to me just as well as anybody else. Um, his breath goeth forth and he returns to his earth. And in that very day, his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 7. Thus says the Lord, cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, in other words, his strength, the thing that he depends on, and whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Again, this idea that don't we can't trust in ourselves. The previous verse that we read there um, talked about the fact that in Psalms talked about the fact that we die and our breath is gone and that's it. There's nothing. I mean, there's nothing we can do once we're dead and there's very little we can do when we're here. <laughs> we know that I don't have a slide for it, but just a couple verses later, 
I'll read for the record, Jeremiah 17, verses 9 through 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reams, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Here, Paul admonishes us of the same thing. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he says here, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish that having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So this, and in this case here, he was talking about the, the Judaizers that were coming in and wanting to have them circumcised and certain other things that they wanted them to do. But this can also be applied to essentially any self-reliance that we have. If we began in the spirit by faith, how do we then think that we're going to be perfected in the flesh? Let's take a look at a little depth here. Proverbs 14, verse 12. <laughs> There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It seems right to a man, but the end are death. The same thing Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things. So here's an example of trusting in the flesh. Genesis chapter six or chapter three, verse six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So there's a couple things going on here. Um, One, both Adam and his wife decided that the food that they already had was not good enough for them. They decided that. Um, They also desired that whatever God had given them to gaze upon and fix their eyes upon and their desires upon wasn't sufficient, that there was more. And they also... um, thought that God was holding back knowledge or wisdom from them. So they first of all had opened their minds to this idea that God was holding back on them. And then after that, they actually took the action of biting, taking the fruit of eating what Satan was putting out. So they trusted in themselves, one, to determine what was actually food what was pleasant to the eyes, and what was would make one wise. They decided these are the things that, that, now someone told them that, but nonetheless, if at this point here, they had stopped and said, wait a minute, we are different. Let's go, let's go talk to God about this. Then it would have been a whole different story, nonetheless. But they, dep- they relied upon themselves first to evaluate the information and decide whether it was correct or not. And then once their self-reliance decision was made that, yes, this is the right thing to do, then they relied upon themselves to decide upon a course of action to bring it about. Thus, following Satan's instructions, go ahead and eat of the fruit. So self-reliance really is what it comes down to. Now, we know in First John that John talks about this, you know, that it's pride, the pride of life, lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh, you know, the lust of life. So those things are all tied in together, pride and fear, people-pleasing, self-reliance. But it really does come down to self-reliance. We rely upon ourselves, our finite selves. We trust in the flesh of others or ourselves. We see here in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. God made man upright, but we have sought out many inventions. We have relied upon ourselves to look out at the world and think, you know, what I have isn't quite enough. And there's that over there that I think if I had that, I would be more happy. And we may be a little more clever in our minds about it than that. We might, instead of looking at it for ourselves, we might think, well, if my family had that, they'd be more happy. If my family had like a nice big old house, they would be happy. So then it's not me, but nonetheless, it's still me deciding based on whatever information I'm being given of what is important. And then I decide what needs to be done to bring it about. And then I use my own power to set forth and make it happen. So it's a losing proposition from the very beginning. 
So remember here, as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, that n- none of what is good comes from ourselves whatsoever. Paul says here, for it is God that works in you, in all of us, both to will and to do of his good pre- pleasure. So not only does he give us the desire to do it, but he gives us the ability to do it. And that comes from God. We see here in uh, Psalm 33, verses 13 through 18. Again, just so we just read out of Ecclesiastes, where God made man upright. But God didn't make man twisted and messed up. He made man upright. It was man that has made the mess out of each other, out of ourselves, and out of the world. But here in Psalm 33, we read, The Lord looks from heaven, and behold, all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looks upon the inhabitants of the earth. He fashioned their hearts alike. So he made us all the same. He made, every one of us, he made us upright. They, well, he didn't give special favor to one over the other. Remember, he created all of us with a desire that all should be saved, that all should turn to him, hear his voice. Now, he did know, as each one of us was created, what our ultimate choice would be. And yet he created us anyway. But nonetheless, he fashioned us all alike. We all had the same chance. We all started at zero, essentially, with nothing but the highest of potential. He considers all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength, and a horse is a vain thing for safety. So, real simple, the king, there's no king that ultimately, if a king is winning battles, it's because the Lord is allowing him to win. There's no king that can absolutely say, I know I will never lose a battle. Um, There's no strong man that could never say, um, I absolutely know that a man stronger than me will never come along and conquer me. Um, And the idea that we can use a horse to escape or to overcome our enemies is just an example of there's nothing in the world that can give us 100% surety or security. There's nothing. There is nothing. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy. So those who trust in him and rely upon him, that's who the Lord's eye is upon. Not that he doesn't see everything. Let's read a couple of parables here. Luke 12, 16 through 21. That's 16 through 19 on the screen here. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room wherefore to bestow all my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Well, that's not necessarily a bad plan. I mean, I don't know about pulling down the barns, but at least, you know, maybe building other ones or whatever, but that's in and of itself, that's not necessarily a bad plan. If you have more than will fit in and you're not coveting or hoarding, um, then you have to do something with it. It would be it would not be a good thing just to let it willy nilly go to waste. So that's not a bad thing. But here's where the twist comes in. He says here, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast many goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. So in other words, he is trusting then on the supposed security that all of this fruit will afford him in his life. And he thinks now I just don't really need to. I, I'm good. I got it covered. I'm, I'm all good. I'm on easy street now. I can just kind of coast. But Jesus illustrates here. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he's saying, it's over. Those, those big barns full of fruit have, there's no way that they're going to extend your life. Your life is over now. No matter what security you thought you had, no matter what sure plans you thought this fruit afforded you, it didn't because you trusted in the wrong thing. He goes on to say, so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So now here he's using a parable that is pretty linked to wealth, money, fruit, you know, so so wealth. and, And he ends it up with treasures are rich toward God. But it's not just about money. It's about anything that we trust in. And so he continues on with another parable that I think is even more instructive in this idea. We're just going to continue on through verse 34. I've got 23 through 26 on the screen here. 
And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you, with, with taking thought, can add to your stature one cubit? If you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take you thought for the rest? So he says, if you can't even do like the smallest thing, the very simplest, smallest thing, then why are you so concerned about all this other stuff that you really have no control over? Things come, things go. Big barns get built, they fall down. Stuff happens. Life goes on. He's saying here, he says here, if then you be not able to do that thing which is least, why take you thought for the rest? So why do you worry about all this stuff? If you're not even able to, to 100% guarantee that this one thing happens that you need, that you think you need, then why do you worry about all this other stuff that you know there's absolutely no way you have any control over? He goes on to say, here, consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, now he's putting a kind of a, a stopper on that idea that if you work hard, you're rewarded. Because he's saying, look, look at, the, look at the lilies. They don't work. They don't toil. They don't plant themselves. And yet look at how wonderfully adorned they are. Much more so than even Solomon who worked hard and built all that stuff. If then God so clothes the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow's cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And seek not ye that, <clears throat> seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. So he's not saying, I mean, we have to eat, we have to drink. He made us this way. But don't make those things the focus of your life. Because whatever plan, whatever scheme you come up with, you can't really pull it off anyway. It's only going to happen if God allows it to happen. I mean, we, you know, every every week, the ladies and everybody, they do some good planning for making sure we have lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And dinner and all this wonderful. But things happen sometimes. People can't make it. Maybe the store gave some bum food, whatever. It, you know, there's so many things that are beyond our control. So, you know, we really probably would be okay if we had to skip a lunch there on a Sabbath or two or whatever, we'd probably make it. Um, I'm not necessarily recommending we do that, but I'm just saying, you know, if things happen. So it has been generally decided that the order of our service and our fellowship here on Sabbath is that we, we gather together um, before the sermon for a, a, a meal and some fellowship and time spent together. And then, and then we have a sermon, and then afterwards we have more food and more fellowship, and then we do second dinner and whatever it might be. So those are generally the things that that unfold, but we should always, as an example, be aware that I don't think in Scripture we can read anywhere that that's the way things have to be. If things don't go that way, if it doesn't work out like that, it should not really be any big issue for any of us. It just shouldn't be. It's not what this is about. We should have our treasure in heaven, not our treasure in the lunch meats. Um, he says here, so I'll finish up this. So neither should be doubtful of a doubtful mind. So that's about lack of faith. So don't be concerned. Don't be fearful about this. Yes, plan ahead. That's fine. Um, but always realize that, one, we need to make sure that our plans are <laughs> in alignment with what God wants, first and foremost. And then, two, realize that if there are any plans that do come about, it's because God has allowed them to come about. It's not because we, by our own strength, our own planning, our own cleverness, have brought them about whatsoever. He finishes it up here. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have needed these things. So that people take this this last verse here, God knows you have need of these things. And they twist this and they say, see, God knows that you need to be rich, that you need to have all kinds of money and have an abundant life. And God knows this, so don't worry about it because he's going to give it to you if you just have faith. That's a twisting of scripture. That's not what it says. 
It's not what it says. He says, don't take concern of that. Carrying on, verses 31 through 34. But rather, seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. See, they said, see, all these things will be added, so you'll get all this stuff. No, what's going to be added unto you? Everything that you need to what? To guess, be joyful in the Lord, but more importantly, to be able to glorify him as we live on a daily basis and spread his word about. It says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So always, I always have to remember this also. Where And, and how can I, what's the first indication that maybe my heart is misaligned? Disappointment, bitterness, anger, murmuring, things like that. You know, doubt of God. Oh, how come this didn't happen? I thought this is what was supposed to happen. Provide bags which wax not old, a treasure in heaven that fails not. Set our heart on that because he said he's going to bring that about so we can know with 100% surety that he will bring that about. He's the only thing that we can have 100% surety in. We can't in any device here on the earth, on anything that exists, on any person, on our own designs and schemes. It isn't us. Matthew 11, verse 25 through 27. So this is, this is God himself, God the Son, incarnate in the flesh, setting the example and he's not just mouthing words here to mouth words. When he was in the flesh, this was part of his life. He was tempted just as we are all tempted and yet without sin. So we see here Matthew eleven twenty five to 27. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of, thy, of my Father. And no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So we, can't, we don't know God the Father except the Son has revealed him to us. We don't know it by our, own, our cleverness, by our smarts, by reading the Bible. That's not why we know the Father. We may know of him by reading the Bible. But we don't know him by reading the Bible. We know it because the Son has said, hey, this is my Father. And, and why do we know the Son? Because the Father has called us to him. So what, what part do we play in there? None. We don't. We don't play any part in there. And he says here, and we're going to dig into this a little more in a few more slides, but he says here, so he's hid these things from the wise and the prudent. In other words, those who think they know already, but he's revealed it unto babes, those who don't know they're not idiots they're not lummoxes but they're they don't they're like i don't i don't know i, I need help i don't know we'll dig into that a little more when we cover poor in spirit paul here in first corinthians chapter four verses four and seven this is four on the screen here now for i know nothing by myself yet am am i not hereby justified but he that judges me is the lord and so Paul here is saying, and Paul knew a lot of stuff, didn't he? Paul knew some stuff. Paul definitely knew some stuff. Trained at the feet of Gamaliel. And, but here he says, I don't know anything of myself. Anything I know, it wasn't from me. And yet even the fact that I say I don't know anything doesn't really justify me either. He goes on in verse 7 to say here, For who makes you to, um, for you to differ from another? And what have you that you didn't receive? Now, if you didn't receive it, uh, now, if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you didn't receive it? So in other words, he's saying here, look, everything that you have that is good, God gave you. And you want to act like a big shot because God gave you something. You want to act like it's something you did or something you came up with or some idea you had. Um, and <laughs> I... 
I, I, I struggle. I was, I've been thinking a lot on this this last couple of weeks as this sermon's been coming together in my heart and my mind and, and on the slides. And uh, one thing I, I noticed, I've been noticing more that at times it is difficult for me not to take credit for stuff. Like it works, something, you know, that's like, so I'm not saying false credit. I'm saying, you know, I mean, I did this or whatever. Um, and, and it's a good example is a, a, a brother just recently shared a link to a, a YouTube video that was kind of clever, but I had actually seen it before. And so I had this urge when it was shared to me to like make that comment. Oh, I already saw that. But why, why, why would that matter? I mean, what would, why would I want to say that? I mean, it's not what, what would that be? But just ego. I mean, what reason, other reason would there be this little thing in me to like say, oh, I are, you know, what, what reason would there be to say that? So that's just an example. I'm talking, I'm, I'm telling on myself here. It's those little things that, that is self-reliance. It is somehow wanting to enjoy some type of status as if somehow I like didn't just receive it from somebody else. I saw the link somewhere else before. So, so what? I mean, it's not like anything, even if I had made that video it would have been with imagination and creativity that god had given me and inspiration that god had given me and a computer and software that god inspired the other people to make and design and 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 god gave me a job to earn the money to be able to buy whatever it is it's not so so even to the subtlest things like that so i have to remember that what everything i have i have been given and ultimately, it has come from God. It may not have come directly from him. It may have come through some conduits. But nonetheless, everything that I have has been given to me. So I certainly have no, I should not try to claim any glory or pride or like, oh, wow, this, this is really, I want to make sure people know that I have this skill or that I accomplish this task or whatever. It doesn't mean that we're, that we're, we're some kind of like milk sops or I mean, it's okay that, you know, God will glorify us and he will, the, the, the parable where he says, don't go to a feast and sit at the head of the table because the master might say then, hey, nah, uh, 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 buddy, you go down there in the kid's table. Rather, better go sit at the kid's table and then the master, if it be so that he wants to, for his purpose, bring attention to you, he'll say, hey, come on up here. I want to point something out or whatever as an example. So, so. But we always have to remember that it's not us. It wasn't. I didn't. I did it because of stuff that God gave me. It wasn't anything that I did. And it's also true that nobody has a head start. Each of us are different. We have different personalities. We have different talents. Some people, and, and I think the, these people are probably more disadvantaged in the Lord, actually, than than others. Some, some people seem better suited personality-wise, temperament-wise, talent-wise to get along in the world and survive in worldly things. In other words, earn money and have friends or whatever, you know, whatever it is that um, than others. But nonetheless, remember what we read in, in Psalms, for example, that he fashioned all our hearts alike. Every one of us started with a clean slate, fully with everything that we need so that we can live a life dependent upon God to glorify his name and ultimately live with him forever every single human being that's ever been born. So nobody has an advantage, none. And I said that I think people who are better at getting along in the world probably have a disadvantage because it's easier then for them to trust in their own self and their own riches and such. So we'll cover that in a little bit. Here, another place in John chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus says, Then Jesus said unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. So even he says, I, I depend upon him entirely. I do his will. I do what he tells me to do. I use what he gives me to be able to accomplish that. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace of God given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> I say this to myself, definitely, as well. So. But to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man 
the measure of faith. So God has, in other places, Paul and, and other other of the the saints write that God has given different men different gifts, different abilities, different roles to fill within the body to glorify him. Some people he has raised up with the knowledge that they will not turn to him. Pharaoh is an example. But Pharaoh was an incredibly talented and gifted man. So unfortunately, he used his gifts and his talents in a manner that did not benefit him but he still brought it about to serve God's purpose. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. So everything we have is from him. It's in him. And this is Paul is talking to the pagans. This is the Christians. So this is one of the core um, attributes of God's character. And one of the core attributes of our relationship with him is that we are totally dependent upon him for everything, whether we realize it or not. Matthew 18, verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So here, Jesus says he uses the little child, so some people twist this to say he should be childlike. That's not what he's saying here whatsoever. But we should be open and innocent and eager to receive whatever our Father has to offer, as children are, without pretense. Matthew 18, verse 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit. So poor, especially I think here in the West, when we hear the word poor, we think men generally with money. Now, I know most of you understand this isn't really talking about money, but it doesn't mean poor as in poor me, but it means poor in that we always realize we are in need of his spirit and his strength. At every moment of every day, in that sense, we are poor. If we are not poor, if we think we are rich in spirit, in this sense, then we're in trouble. We'll cover this in a little more depth here in a, in a few more slides. Um, also, just another verse in Mark 10, verse 14. I don't have a slide, but it's similar to eight, Matthew 18, 4. It says here, But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. So we need to be poor of spirit. We need to be open. We need to realize that we always need him. There's never a time when we don't need him. There's never a time when we can just kind of say, all right, God, I got this. I got it. I don't, you know, go ahead, go, go make a sandwich or whatever. There's never a time ever. Apparently I have sandwiches on the mind today. I don't know what. Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse 11a. Here's a warning, another warning. Deuteronomy 11 or 8, 11a, beware that you forget not the Lord thy God. And then skipping down to verses 17 and 18 here in the same chapter. And you say in your heart, my power and the might of mine hand has gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth, that he, is, and that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. So remember, it's him that gives you everything you have. And why is it? So that he can glorify his name and bring about the turn of many sons and daughters to glory. It's not us. Don't ever say, it's by my might and my power. And I think, um, like I said, uh, myself, one of the early and easiest warning signs when I'm leaning that way is when I all of a sudden I need to Make sure you understand, well, I already knew that, or I don't need that, or I already did that, done that, been there, whatever it might be, you know. That's easy to watch for myself if I'm willing to pay attention. Right, Josh, yeah, as Josh says, yeah, I was, yep, so as Josh says, he actually gave me the breath to actually say the words that I just said, even, that's, so to the littlest things. Now, does that mean that we consume our lives entirely with thinking, oh, thank you for that breath, God, thank you for that breath, thank you for that breath? No, absolutely not, but we always have to be aware, and how do I know 
if I'm aware of this in general, if my general bias or the general um, state of my spirit is one of acknowledgement and understanding of my ultimate dependence upon him, is that when the tea starts to get heated up a little bit, what happens? How, what, what's my reaction? Do I react in self-reliance, defensiveness, fear? Or do I realize, wow, thanks, God, for letting me be part of that? Or, oh, thanks for helping me out there or whatever it is. Or I need you even more. We tend to think, you know, of I need God's help when I'm in trouble. But I think we actually, I actually need God's help even more when I'm not in trouble. Because then I'm just way more prone to just be way off in left field in a heartbeat, you know. Because it's like, I got this. I got it. Proverbs 30, verses 8 through 9. This is one of the Proverbs that is not attributed to Solomon, but nonetheless. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Pretty straightforward. Don't give me too much. Don't give me too little. Just give me what I need, essentially what we read of the parables out of Luke that Jesus talked about, you know, that your heavenly father knows you have need of these things. Don't toil about them. Don't fret about it. Don't be concerned. Don't be doubtful. He's got you covered. So here's a good warning. So like I said, I would imagine most of us, except perhaps in jest and in proper company, would ever really have the idea that, oh man, I'm a self-made man. I did all this my own self. You know, I, I doubt that probably most people that are hearing my voice now would think that extremely in regards to self-reliance. But as we've been talking about, self-reliance is much more subtle than that. Much, much more subtle. But it is very, very dangerous. It will, it will ultimately, if we continue down that road of self-reliance, get us cut off. We'll, we'll turn from God because we don't know. We don't need him and we don't know him anymore because we've been too busy going about our own stuff. So here in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, we read, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. That's self-reliance. Now, this is talking about men, you know, in a much grander, so most of us probably would read this section of Romans and think, well, I'm not that. I'm not worshiping trees or animals or none of that stuff. This is all about them pagans that worship all them other gods, and I'm not one of those. But this is self-reliance. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. So if that's in my heart, then I'm in the same state as all the people that Paul is writing about here, Romans, Romans chapter 1 here. Um, I don't have a slide for it, but in just as was expected and just as was warned, um, Israel would do and did do. Um, we are prone to do the same thing as individuals. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 15, we read here, but Jeshurun waxed fat. That's just another name for Israel. And kicked, you're waxing fat, you're grown thick, you're covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. That's what happened. That's what was warned about, and that's what happened. So they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. So as I said, most of us probably would say, well, I'm not one of them, you know, pagan idol worshipers. I'm not out there doing Christmas or none of that stuff or whatever. So Romans 121, while, all, while good and all, doesn't really apply to me directly. Yes, it does. If we have any self-reliance in us, it absolutely does. This next set of verses that I'm going to read here also, we would probably think don't apply to us, but they absolutely can. This is an, a perfect definition or example of self-reliance over God's reliance. It is a perfect example. That I haven't turned to the slide yet. It is a perfect example of setting our heart on things that God does not want us to do and then employing whatever efforts we think need to happen so that we can bring it about. So Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14 here. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
So this obviously is about Lucifer and what he did. But when we decide to reject God's counsel and to rely upon our own mind and rely upon our own resources, we are doing exactly the same thing that Lucifer is guilty of here. Exactly the same thing. Have you ever been in a situation where someone has offered help when he didn't really need it or want it even? Um, children are a good example of this as they attempt, they attempt to exert their independence. You know, it's like, no, 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 I can get dressed myself, you know, or I can go to the bathroom myself or I can, you know, I can eat myself. I don't need you to spoon food into me or whatever. Um, this is just self-reliance exerting itself. Now, oddly enough, as children get older and they get into their teen years and all of a sudden they want everything done for them again. Make me dinner, clean my lawn, you know, do my laundry, you know, where's my keys at, where's my school books at or whatever. So it's kind of the reverse there. But nonetheless, isn't that right, Josh? Isn't that what happened? <laughs> so, but it's all about self-reliance. It's all about, and, and so we look at these things, Romans chapter one, for example, Isaiah chapter 14, and we see, you know, that the, the specific context is not about saints. It's not, you know, Romans 1, 21 is about people that have flat out said, no, God doesn't exist. I'm going to serve this idol instead. Uh, Isaiah 14 is definitely specifically about Lucifer. But the spirit that is intoned within the hearts of those men and this, this being can fully be ingrained within the Christian as well, if we are reliant upon ourselves. And if we continue down that path long enough, we know in Romans 21 or Romans 1 what happens. He's going to give us over to our desires and our lusts. Fine. You don't want my help. You want to rely upon yourself. Have at it. We never want that to happen. I never want it to happen to me, and I don't want it to happen to any of you either. Rebellion is as witchcraft. So how can we how can we prepare our hearts and strengthen ourselves against this propensity of the the human heart that has been tainted by sin once the heart has been tainted by sin it has a bias left to its own devices to be self-reliant to ignore what God wants and ignore the provision that God has given us to live our life in a proper manner um, it is not the bias of a pure human heart that God created upright, but once we have tainted it with sin and filled it with our own stuff, then it sticks in there if we allow it to. So Luke chapter 7, verses 40 through 43, here we read, And Jesus answered, said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he says, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he, Jesus, said unto him, you have rightly judged. So again, here he uses an example that has monetary a monetary context, but it can be applied in any context, anything that any treasure that we set our heart upon. And it doesn't even necessarily need to be forgiveness because there are many things that he has given me in my life or protected me from that had nothing to do with forgiveness. He has certainly forgiven me for many things, but he has done much more for me than just forgive me. So while this parable here is about forgiveness and the fact that if we realize how much we have been forgiven, the natural reaction would be to love the forgiver. That's what this parable is about. But it's also true that not just in forgiveness, but to whom much is given. We should love greater. We should appreciate it. We should have an attitude of gratitude. So let's take a look here. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So first, as what Ecclesiastes kind of inferred here, we're born upright. He has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, we don't necessarily pursue those things with the zeal with which we should. But God is merciful and gracious. And many of us, um, after a period of time in our life that we 
by his grace survived and lived through, we repented of those and we turned to him and we asked for forgiveness. But he has given us, so not only has he, he given us the wonderful things, everything that we need that pertain on, pertains unto life and godliness, he has forgiven us when we have thrown those by the wayside. Peter goes on to say here, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. So we got those two. So we got forgiveness for what we shouldn't have done or what we should have done that we didn't do. And we have been given everything that we need that pertains unto life and godliness. And even more so, we have exceeding great and precious promises for the hope that dwells within us, both here in this life and in the life eternal. And he finishes this verse up here that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And that's the forgiveness part. So he kind of has all three here in this verse, or these two verses. The forgiveness, we escaped the corruption because he forgave us and he gave us his spirit. He's given us everything that we need to be able to live the new life because we can't rely upon ourselves at all. So he's given us everything we need. And not only that, he's given us exceeding great and precious promises. Gratitude. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8. I know Philippians 8, 4, 8, and I especially is, I enjoy that verse very much. But here he says, Paul tells us, be careful for nothing. In other words, this is the same thing that Jesus said in the parables um, that we read in Luke. Don't, don't worry. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. Whatever that might be, he knows. If you have your heart set on what he has his heart set on for you, then you need not fear at all. He knows what you need. And don't worry about it. He's got it covered. You will have it. So Paul here says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving or gratitude, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we don't even do that. It's everything. He gives us everything we need. We have nothing of ourselves. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, and whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Don't dwell on what you can't do or what you think might happen or what you think you might need or how you're going to get it or how you're going to prevent something from happening. And yeah, yes, as life unfolds, things happen, circumstances happen. We need to address them and pay attention. But nonetheless, ultimately, it's him. It's all for him and from him. It's an attitude of gratitude, not self-sufficiency, not whatsoever. And if we realize that everything we have is from him, then it's much easier to understand how foolish the idea of self-reliance really is. Not for others, but for ourselves. Uh, skipping down in that same chapter, chapter, verses 11b through 13, he says here, Paul says, For I have learned that in whatsoever state I am wherewith to be content, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So this is an interesting verse. So this kind of seems to be he's kind of setting those juxtaposed to each other, it seems. So he's saying, okay, so sometimes, um, you know, I'm hungry and sometimes I'm full. Sometimes I'm abounding. Sometimes I'm suffering need. And I know how to be cool in all of those situations. But I don't think that's what he's saying here. He's saying that that's the constant stated then while we already have everything that we need that pertains unto life and godliness. And that he has given us exceeding great and precious promises. And that he has given us his spirit and he has forgiven us for our sins. So in that sense, we are completely full. We can't be any fuller than that. At the same time, we are always empty. We always need him. We have no self-reliance. We have no self-sufficiency. There is nothing on which we can depend upon ourselves or any others for. That we always must depend on him. So in that sense, we always must be poor in spirit. Always, no matter what fullness he has given us no matter what abounding we may see in our life at the same time we must always have both we must always as he just said in the verses just before we must always be filled with joy that all these things god gives us remember paul wrote this letter from from jail he wrote it from prison so it wasn't like a happy place he's not being a hypocrite here he's not just writing some kind of lofty 
esoteric essay about, oh, this is how it should be. This is the real deal. It only comes from God. So we have to learn how to be abased and to abound. We know, have to know how to be full and to be hungry and to abound and to suffer need. At the same time, always. We always, no matter how well things are going or how poorly things seem to be going, we always have to realize that at the very at that exact moment, we have everything we need from him, and yet we need him for absolutely everything. We are full and we are empty. We are poor in spirit. Not pitiful, not murmuring, not full of self-pity, but poor in spirit. We need. We rely upon him and upon him only. And if we can understand I'm going to speak of myself when I can understand just what he has done for me in the manner of forgiveness and promises and the gifts that he has given, whether they seem to be things that I enjoy or not. Then the gratitude is just naturally there to whom he is for, much is forgiven will love more. It's just Proverbs chapter three, verse six. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. So if we pay attention to him, acknowledge him, okay, God, this is, what do you want me to do? And give me what I need to do it. Then he'll direct my paths. I have no, no concern. I don't have to worry about, well, is it going to be the right thing or is it going to happen? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks for all things, always whether they be good things or bad things, whatever they are, give thanks always. Be grateful. Why? Because of what he's done. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. That's God's will, that we give thanks, that we be grateful, that we have grateful hearts so that we can realize our need for him. If we're not grateful, then we're not necessarily pleased with what we think he has given us. So we're not going to, we're not going to be prone to then lean more on him. Just think about this in a worldly way. You know, if you have someone, a coworker, for example, that you depended on for accomplishing some task and they didn't do it, then you're going to be less prone to depend upon that coworker the next time. Well, if we, in our own minds, begin to shun God and despise what he has done for us and his plans for us, then it's just, it's, it's going to get worse and worse. Let's repent and turn from those things. Another really good example, Job chapter one, verse 21. We all know what, what God did through Job for us. And Job said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return hither. The Lord gave and the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Gratitude, grateful. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Gratitude, thanksgiving. Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. A thankful, grateful spirit. This is the spirit that will truly be reliant upon him and shun reliance upon ourselves. I mean, we, we really should, if, if someone else had been as unreliable to me in my life as I have been, I would not have anything to do with that person. I mean, that person would be the last person that I would trust in. And yet still, apart from paying attention to God's spirit, I'm prone to trust in myself. And yet I have failed myself in ways I can't even imagine or count. Ken apparently will count them for me, though. Thank you very much. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. 
Here Paul tells us, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. In other words, we're thankful. We glorify him, we glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, experience hope, and hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Gratitude. So if we realize that our only hope in success in this life, and success I define as understanding God's will and accomplishing it by what he has given me to do it with. That's how I define the success, and ultimately we will receive eternal life. But on a daily basis, on a minute-to-minute basis, if I understand what God's will is and I rely upon him for the provision for that will to come about, that is a successful moment in my life. So he says here, um, and, and the way that I, the way that I bring that about or the way that God brings that about in me is by his spirit. So I would want to make sure that I don't quench the spirit, that I don't cut myself off from the spirit, that I don't reject the spirit. So the good news is, as we read in Luke here, for example, eleven thirteen, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit? to them that ask. He wants to give it to us. Paul here admonishes us, and he says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. As Christians, we have his Spirit. Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you trusted, they trusted in God, not in themselves, not in Paul, in God. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You were given everything you need that pertains unto life and holiness. For uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And Ephesians 5, 18. He tells us here, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So this doesn't necessarily need to be wine. It could be anything. Be not drunk with self-reliance, with anything that prevents us from being subject to and sensitive to the Spirit and the power that we receive through it. We don't. And I was going to, I decided not to dig into it. Uh, It's a little side topic, but the idea that We don't get, Scripture does not teach that we need to be continually filled up with the Spirit, like we're like a tire that like goes down, a pressure goes down, and we need to be pumped back up with more Spirit. We're given the Spirit to whatever measure God gives us the Spirit. That's what we are given the Spirit. When when we become His, we receive the Holy Ghost. Now, we do certainly deaden our sensitivity to it. We quench it. We disobey it. um, And ultimately, if we continue down that road, it will be withdrawn. I hope that doesn't happen to any of us. But it's not a matter of, okay, now I need to be filled more with the Spirit. He's already given us everything, everything that we need. Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49. Another parable. And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man that builds a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. So this is an example. It's founded upon something that is solid. That rock is Christ. It is God. It is founded upon the one and only thing that can give us assurance, God. And he can give us assurance in all things. But he that hears and does not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So in this example here, Trusting it in ourselves is no foundation. We may think it's a foundation, and those of us, maybe those those who are maybe better equipped to go about in the world and make it in the world might think somehow, yeah, I got a pretty solid foundation. Look, you know, I can withstand a lot of, you know, back and forth and blowing of the winds in the world and things that happen, but no, not so. 
there's only one foundation, and that is Christ. If we do not have that foundation, then we have no foundation whatsoever. So the 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 opening slide, and actually you can't really see it, but the so behind the little self reliance at the bottom there is like a crumbled brick wall. I mean that's what that's the idea. It's like it's not, you know, there is no foundation. It may seem like there is. That's the that's actually the most deceptive part of it is that relying upon ourselves a little here, a little there, or maybe a lot here and a lot there may seem to bear fruit and bring about happiness and success, but it doesn't. It can't. Not even one little bit. It's not. If it's not founded upon the rock, then it is upon nothing, and it will be washed away. So, as I'd said, it happens from time to time that this self-reliance rears one of its ugly heads. It does. Yeah, I think it is, yes. So... What do we do when it does? None of us should plan when we wake up in the morning. Well, I'm going to, from from 11 to 11.30, I'm going to do some self-reliance. We should never do that. Definitely not. If you are if you are doing that kind of thing, you better check yourself. But it does happen, essentially. So what happens? What can we do if it does happen? Well, let's take a look here, for example, in Psalm 51, verse 10. First, we can be honest and admit that it happened. We don't necessarily need to go tell everybody. If we have involved others in our transgression and our self-reliance, we probably should at least go and say, I shouldn't have, that was improper. I shouldn't have done it that way. That was wrong. But, but nonetheless, certainly before God, we need to ask him to create in us a clean heart and, oh, God, renew a right spirit within me because I've quenched the spirit somewhat. Um, I have cut it off, and I, that needs to be rectified. Otherwise, it's just going to be more of the same. I need to rely upon him, and I need to understand and be sensitive to my need for him. And I cannot do that if I am dulling the Spirit's prompting within me. And that's what happens when we sin and don't repent of it. Psalm 19, verses 13 through 14 here is another good example, another good mindset to have. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins, like relying upon myself. And let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I rely upon him. And when I have realized that I did not stop right there, this all started in the garden. I mean, it wasn't, it's nothing new. It started in the garden. It isn't anything. They relied upon themselves. Um, And then they did not turn back to him and ask for forgiveness. And it's not any different now. Now, there may be consequences as a result of my act of disobedience, my self-reliance to God. Um, And these aren't necessarily punishments. If I have already repented of it and I have I've acknowledged my transgression and I have repented of it, then God isn't still whooping me about it. He's forgiven me. That's over. But there may be consequences, but remember those consequences also, God brings every single thing to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't mean that, oh, sometimes it's a good thing that I was disobedient there because then this other thing happened. No, not so. That's just more of a testimony to how great and wonderful he is, is he can take a total, complete failure and take something out of that to make something good. Pharaoh is an excellent example. What Pharaoh did is not to be extolled or emulated or desired whatsoever, and yet look at what God did through his disobedience. So if there are circumstances to endure or to suffer through as a result of this, first and foremost, know that God has forgiven me. If I have repented of it and acknowledged my sin and turned to him and asked for forgiveness and that he renewing me a right heart and a new a right spirit within me and a clean heart then he does that he is faithful he that's all he, he wants to do that so i don't need to be concerned about that and i don't need to be doubtful about that fact but as if these circumstances unfold i, I should always remember how do i deal with them i deal with them in grace by his spirit and i employ the um the provisions that he gives me to get through them so that it will glorify him not by self-reliance it's the worst thing it's 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 the, that's and and the human heart stained with sin stained stained with sin um, <laughs> is uh, 
prone to do that if we do not obey the promptings of the Spirit. And once we fall into this self-reliance, then we just want to create more of the same when we realize, oh, that was a mess. Now I want to fix this and fix this. And it's not. You can't. Once Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, there wasn't no putting them back together again. As we read here in Psalm 86, verse 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call unto thee. And in Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So self-reliance is the same thing. It is ultimately in the same sin that Lucifer committed that we read about in Isaiah 14. It's the same sin that's discussed in Romans chapter 1. And if it is pursued and continued in, unabated and unchecked and unrepented of, it will end up in the same spot that the people in Romans chapter 1 are going to end up in. We don't want that to happen. But he is, all he wants to do is forgive. He's constantly calling out, where are you? Where are you? Don't hide behind the bushes. Come out. He says, look, come boldly into the throne of grace. Not because of who we are or what we have done, but come boldly because of who he is and the precious promises that he has done, given us and the work that his son did so that we can be forgiven. Turn to him as a child, eager, trusting. And one closing verse here. I think sums it up. 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no other foundation can man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's it. If we rely upon that entirely and wholly, we know that he has given us everything we need, first and foremost, to be forgiven for our transgressions that we have already committed. We need not live in fear for what the future holds because there is no device nor thing of man or powers in heaven that can overcome his purpose for us whatsoever, that we are given everything we need. And even so more, we are promised that if we will continue to hear him and follow him, and receive everything that he has given us with thanksgiving and with gratitude and with a spirit of desire to, to glorify him, that we will receive eternal life on that final day during the resurrection. So, brothers and sisters, Godspeed.